Well, good morning, beloved. We're going to pick back up in 1 Corinthians now, chapter 12. But before we get into it, let me just um, give you a little overview of what's to come ahead. Uh, chapter 12, in chapter 12, Paul uh, starts speaking of the gifts of the Spirit. And chapters 12 through 14, Paul turns to these gifts and addresses some of the abuses that the Corinthians were exhibiting towards them. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but they were. And he was having to, chapters 12 through 14. 12 is where he lays out the gifts for the most part. But 13 and 14 especially is where he starts kind of getting on them because of their lack of love in, in, in using the gifts and in their misuse of some of the gifts. And so this chapter 12, 13, and 14, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time in these three chapters. Look at This week we're going to overview chapter 12, which is an overview of the gifts. And then the next few weeks we're going to be digging down deeper into the different gifts of the Spirit. And you're going to find that some of these gifts were temporary sign gifts. And, and are not for today. They're not in, a, in active today. Now some in the charismatic field would argue, oh, all the gifts are for today. But I'm going to hopefully show you from the Word of God that that's not so. Uh, and then, we're just it's going to be a few weeks getting through chapters 12 through 14. So let me just dive in and start on verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And this first portion that we're looking at is showing us the Holy Spirit's role concerning the spreading of the gospel and spiritual gifts. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, Albert Barnes comments that the argument is that the Holy Spirit in all instances would do honor to Jesus Christ and would prompt all who were under his influence to love and reverence his name. End of quote. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now MacArthur says, John MacArthur says this. He says, John gives us a measuring stick to determine whether the propagator of the message is a demon spirit or the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is the first test of a true teacher. They acknowledge and proclaim that Jesus is God incarnate in human flesh. The Greek construction does not mean that they confess Christ as having come to earth, but they confess that he came in the flesh to the earth. That is, his human body was physically real. Both the full humanity and full deity of Jesus must be equally maintained by the teacher who is to be considered genuinely of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies to the true nature of the Son, while Satan and his force distort and deny that true nature. End of quote by John MacArthur. You see, in that day, especially in that day, there were those who claimed that Jesus being the Son of God, they, they were known as Gnostics. And the Gnostics had a belief 
that the flesh is evil, the flesh is bad, so therefore Jesus could not have come in the flesh. What we saw, what you saw of Jesus was just a physical emanation, but it wasn't really flesh and blood like we are. It was just made to look like flesh and blood. And that's what John and and so many of the apostles, Paul and all, are fighting. And, And that's why he brought out that unless a person confesses that Jesus came in the flesh... He was 100% human. He had a fleshly body. Then that spirit, if you don't confess that, that is not of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will bring you to the point where you see that Jesus was a man. It's the Spirit of God who reveals the truth about Jesus Christ, and this truth will never contradict God's Word. In Matthew 16, verse 17 Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed it to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And what had been revealed to Peter? What had been revealed to him was that Jesus Christ was indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in John fifteen twenty six, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. So we see here that the Spirit reveals Jesus and who Jesus is to his people. And he also testifies, that's what he does, he testifies of Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ is. Those who present something false about Jesus Christ Christ the Lord, or about the gospel which he and the apostles proclaimed, are under a curse. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it reads, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach another gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Well, Joseph Smith who got the golden plates from, so-called golden plates from the angel Moroni, which is where the Book of Mormon come from, that angel that spoke to Joseph Smith is cursed, and so is Joseph Smith, according to Galatians 1.8. And Paul reiterates in verse 9 again, As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preaches another gospel to you than that you have received, let him be accursed. And we shouldn't be surprised, beloved, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. John MacArthur writes, or excuse me, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong place in my notes. Calvin says, As the wicked sometimes speak of Christ in honorable and magnificent terms, is this an indication that they have the Spirit of God? Now let me read that again that Calvin said. As the wicked sometimes speak of Christ in honorable and magnificent terms, is this an indication that they have the Spirit of God? I answer, they undoubtedly have so far as that effect is concerned. But the gift of regeneration is one thing, and the gift of bare intelligence, with which Judas himself was endowed when he preached the gospel, is quite another. Hence, too, we perceive how great our weakness is, as we cannot so much as move our tongue for the celebration of God's praise, unless it be governed by His Spirit. Of this the Scripture also frequently reminds us, And the saints everywhere acknowledge that unless the Lord opens their mouth, they're not fit to be the heralds of his praise. Among others, Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah 6, 5. That's the end of Calvin's quote. And Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 21 through 23 seem to indicate that what Calvin said is true. Because Jesus said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, now this is Jesus speaking, beloved, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
Haven't we prophesied in thy name, and then the name cast out devils, and then I name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, so here we see that the wicked prophesied in his name, they cast out devils in his name, and in his name did many wonderful works. All this teaches us that God can even use sinful, wicked men to do his work. But that's not a guarantee that they have the Spirit of God within them. Only the Spirit of God working through them. Paul hinted at this in Philippians 1, verses 15 through 18. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preaches Christ of contention not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So you see, the Holy Spirit can speak through Wicked, lost people. There's many a, a preacher that's been in a pulpit that's as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. They don't know the Lord, but they're preaching the truth, and the, and the only way they can preach the truth is by the Spirit of God enabling them to do that. But that does not mean that they are regenerated and that they're saved. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what we just that Calvin said. And it's true. There's certain things that if a person says, you can know right away whether they're of God or not of God. But sometimes it's hard to tell if a person is speaking the truth whether they are of God or not because they're speaking the truth. But God knows, and that's why it's so important, beloved, to just make sure that your heart is right with God. Please, beloved, make sure your heart is right with God. Well, secondly, let's look at verses 4 through 6 in 1 Corinthians 12. And these verses show us the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit concerning the spiritual gifts. We read, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which works all in all. Let me read that to you in a couple of other versions. In the easy or in the uh, English Standard Version, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in every one. Now let me read the easy read version to you. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but they're all from the same Spirit. There are different ways to serve, but we serve the same Lord. There are different ways that God works in people, but it is the same God who works in all of us to do everything. Now in all of these translations, we see a commonality. They all say the same Spirit the same Lord, the same God. All the gifts are given by the Spirit of God to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with the Father empowering and working through those gifts in different ways to accomplish His will. Therefore, we are gifted by the Spirit to serve the Lord Jesus through the power of the Father to accomplish His will within the body of Christ. We serve the Lord by serving His people. Well, now let's look at verse 7. And in this verse, it teaches us that every born-again Christian, every born-again Christian, is gifted by the Spirit for the edification or the building up of the whole body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 in the King James says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. And that to profit withal means to profit all. 
in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, the, ease, the English Standard Version, to each is given the manifestation, manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then in the Easy Read Version, something from the Spirit can be seen in each person. The Spirit gives this to each one to help others. Now here's the truth that I want to bring out of this one verse in verse 7. Gifts are not given for self-edification. Although that is a byproduct of using them to serve others, yet they are not they were not given there's no gift that's been given for self edification but there's many charismatics that say that's exactly what some of the gifts are for is for self edification but it's not it the gifts were given as we see here in verse 7 by the spirit to for the profit of the whole body not for self edification but for the profit of all now, next, verses 8 through 11. These verses show us that the Spirit of God determines who gets what gifts. And we read in verses 8 through 11 in the King James, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now let me read that in the English Standard Version. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit, by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Again, we see the phrase repeated, by the same Spirit, over and over again. Why is Paul emphasizing this so much? Why is he saying it in this way? Well, beloved, it's because of this. Within the Corinthian church, there was jealousies over the Spirit, over the gifts of the Spirit. And there was one thinking, well, my gift is better than your gift. And your gift isn't as good as my gift. And, and some were saying, well, I want this gift here because it's, it's a more flashy gift. I don't want just this gift. And you see, that was going on in this church. And Paul was trying to con show them, look, guys, all of the gifts are given by the same Spirit. And he gives them as he wills. A child of God does not choose what gift he receives. It's totally up to the Spirit of God. But the emphasis of by the same Spirit teaches us that every gift that is given is very important. And none are more or less important than others, for it's the Spirit of God that gives it. Someone gifted with the gift of prophecy might start to think himself better than one gifted with only the gift of administration. One given the gift of working miracles might think himself better than one given the gift of discerning of spirits, and so on. Which evidently was happening within the church of Corinth, since Paul was even having to bring this up, and because of what he wrote next. In verses 12 through 26, we're going to see that there is no gift, therefore no person more important than another within the body of Christ. Listen to what he says. For as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, 
and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body, or I am not the hand, so I am not of the body, it's therefore, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. But you see, that was going on, beloved. That was going on. There was feelings of superiority that, yeah, we don't need you, you you've only got this little gift over here. And, it, and that's wrong, that was bad, and that's what Paul was having to address in this letter. No, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together, having, been, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked that there should be no schism, no disunity in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, beloved, we have some in our church that are gifted with preaching, some with teaching, some with singing, some with administrative and financial gifts, some with hospitality and serving gifts, some with maintenance skills, some with electronic equipment skills, some with security skills, some with the gifts of working with children, some with discerning of spirits, and some are prayer warriors. We need them all in order for this church to function properly. And remember, whatever your gift is, God gifted you with that gift to accomplish His purposes. And He expects you to use that gift or gifts to help build up the body of Christ and to bring honor and glory to Christ Jesus our Lord. We are many members, but one body. We should never be envious of the gifts God go, chose to give to another, for He gave it for the body which we are all part of. Remember, a Christ, as a Christian, you've been gifted by God. For the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every child of God for the good of the whole body. If you don't know what your gift or gifts are, then ask God to show you. Or, or ask someone else who knows you well, and probably they'll be able to tell you what your gifts are, what you're good at, what you're blessed in. Then get busy serving the Lord by serving others within the body of Christ with your God-given gifts. Finally, Paul speaks of a more excellent way. In verses 27 through 31, Now are you the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. <coughs> and now Paul's going to ask a rhetorical question. And a rhetorical question begs an answer. And, and the rhetorical question that he's get, questions he's getting ready to ask all beg the answer, no. Okay? Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But covetly, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show to you a more excellent way. Now, Paul said, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Now, there's some differences of opinion on the translation of this phrase among scholars. 
Albert Barnes, speaking about where it says, but covet earnestly, he says, the Greek is be zealous for. This word, however, may be either in the indicative mood, ye do covet earnestly, or in the imperative, as in our translation. Doddridge contends that it should be rendered in the indicative mood, as does John MacArthur, for he says it seems to be a contradiction that after the apostle has been showing that these gifts were not at their own option, that they ought not to emulate the gifts of others, or aspire to superiority, to undo all again and give them such contrary advice. The same view is given by Locke and McKnight. The Syriac version renders it, Because you are zealous of the best gifts, I will show to you a more excellent way. But, says uh, Albert Barnes, there's no valid objection to the common translation in the imperative, and indeed the connection seems to demand it. Grotius renders it, Pray to God that you may receive from him the best, that is, the most useful endowments. This, now, this is what Barnes seems to think. He's putting it into his own words, what Paul's trying to say to them. Okay, So this is, this is sort of like Albert Barnes' paraphrase of what Paul just wrote in verses 27 through 31. He says this, I have proved that all endowments in the church are produced by the Holy Spirit and that he confers them as he pleases. I have been showing that no one should be proud or elated on account of extraordinary endowments, and that on the other hand, no one should be depressed or sad or discontent because he has a more humble rank. I have been endeavoring to repress and subdue the spirit of discontent, jealousy, and ambition, and to produce a willingness in all to occupy the station where God has placed you. But I do not intend to deny that it is proper to desire the most useful endowments that a man should wish to be brought under the influence of the Spirit and qualified for eminent usefulness. I don't, do not mean to say that it's wrong for a man to regard the higher gifts of the Spirit as valuable and desirable, if they may be obtained, nor that the Spirit which seeks to excel in spiritual endowments and in usefulness is improper. Yet all cannot be apostles, all cannot be prophets. Now that's the end of the quote by Albert Barnes. Spiros Zodahades adds in his complete word study New Testament, he says, The best gifts mentioned here refer to those which are most useful. The Corinthian believers were desiring the gifts that would bring them the most acclaim and prestige among their fellow brethren in Christ. That is, the gift of tongues, of prophecies, of knowledge, as is evidenced by Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 13.8, Charity never fails, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Instead, Paul urged them to covet, earnestly, covet or earnestly desire the gifts that would best benefit the cause of Christ, not themselves. In chapter 13, Paul further explains that the gifts must be done in love for Christ, not for self. So what are we to think of all this seeming confusion concerning this? Well, the plain truth, I believe, that's being conveyed is in this chapter is this. Now, this is Dempsey speaking. We must realize that it's the Spirit of God that grants spiritual gifts as He so pleases. And therefore, if we have gifts that put us in the limelight... We're not to look down our noses at others who have gifts that keep them out of the limelight. And those who have gifts that seem to be hidden to others within the body must not be jealous of those who have been gifted with gifts that do put them in the limelight. But it's not wrong to seek the Lord for greater gifts that would allow you to better edify or build up the body of Christ. Paul, in fact, speaks to this very thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, he says, Follow after charity, and that's agape love, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. And that just simply means preach. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no man understands him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. 
But he that prophesies speaks unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. As I said at the beginning, next week we'll delve deeper into looking at the individual gifts of the Spirit. Some of the gifts were temporary sign gifts and some still exist today. There is much debate among Christians concerning this, but we're going to try and let Scripture speak and where it's silent, grant grace. So what are we to think of all this? Pray to the Lord and give your heart to the Lord and seek to serve Him with what gifts He's given you. And if He so desires to give you more gifts, great. Use them for the body, to build up the body of Christ. Amen? Amen.